be at tonight, John chapter 8. I want you to find that. And when you find it, I want you to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. John chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 31. And uh, I'm going to read, uh, let's see, verse 31 and 32. And I'm going to focus mainly on one particular part of that, but I want us to read it. Verse 31 says, Then Jesus said to those Jews, those Jews who believed him, those Jews, what is up with my reading today? <laughs> Jesus said to those Joes, so if anybody's a Joe in here, Jesus is talking to you, all right? Jesus said to the Jews, I figured this out. I am a constant amusement for you people. I, I've, I figured that out, all right? As so Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And they answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone how can you say we will be made free? Let's go ahead and read. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word tonight. We ask that you speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now, for those of you who are just trickling in this afternoon and you haven't been here the last little while, we've been in a series that we have called War. And we are talking about the battle of spiritual warfare that Christians find themselves in on a daily basis. Now, if you are not aware of that, I just need you to understand that you are in a war. You are in a battle. It is taking place in your life every single day. Satan doesn't like you. He doesn't like Jesus. He doesn't like anything to do with Jesus. And so he's trying to wreck our life. So listen to this. Here's what we know so far. We're in this extreme battle with Satan and his demonic forces. This battle is spiritual, but oftentimes it manifests itself physically, and it weaves its way into our lives through the manipulation, listen, the manipulation of the mind. So it is imperative that you and I passionately and prayerfully guard our minds. People, listen to me. Do not leave your mind unguarded. If you leave your mind unguarded, you are going to be demolished by demonic forces. And so it's important for us to make sure that we guard our minds in everything that we do. Our minds are a doorway into our actions, our emotions, our speculations, and our behavior. Now listen to me carefully. No matter how Satan manipulates, maneuvers, and tempts, and that's what he does. He manipulates, he maneuvers around, he tempts us in so many, so many ways. And all of those tactics of doing that is designed to destroy truth from our life. That's what he desires to do. He desires to make sure that you and I are not getting the truth that God wants to go inside our minds. Now remember this. This is important. The Bible says in John chapter 8 verse 44, and we've talked about this before in the series, it says about Satan that he was a murderer from the beginning and he does not stand in truth because there is, listen, no truth in him whatsoever. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. So what does that tell you? That tells you that Satan is never going to tell you the truth because every little shred of truth that he will tell, he's going to have a pack of lies to go along with it so he can deceive you. And so we need to understand that Satan is out there and he's trying his best to destroy truth in our life. Perhaps tonight if we could walk outside and we could pull back the curtain into the heavens, we would probably see millions and millions and millions of fiery darts and lies that Satan is casting, him and his demonic minions are casting into our minds trying to get us to live our lives based on a lie and not the truth. Satan desires to destroy truth from your mind. Mark it down, note it, believe it, remember it, because that's exactly what he's trying to do. So tonight, what I want us to talk about, we've talked about the battle of the mind, we talked about the battle of the emotions last week. What I want to talk about is this battle for truth. I want to see it from two perspectives. I want us to see it from a practical perspective, and then I want us to see it from a biblical perspective. So everybody look at your neighbor and say, I'm ready for this. All right, good, rest of you. Uh, there you go. He's already got you. You know what I'm saying? 
So two, two ways we want to look at it, practically and biblically, as it pertains to truth. So let's start with the practical perspective of truth. The first thing we need to do is we need to ask ourselves this question, what is truth? All right, what is truth? If we're going to talk about truth, we need to know what truth is. Well, here's what the definition of truth is from a practical perspective. Truth is the body of real things, real events, and real facts. It is the state of being the case. In other words, it is what it is. Truth is truth. It is real facts, it is real events, and it is real things. Now, what, let me tell you what truth isn't, because you need to know this part, especially in the culture that we live in. You young people need to pay attention to this part. What truth isn't? Truth isn't, listen to this, it isn't your own opinions, decisions, or perceptions. Truth is not relative to our preferences or our demands. Does that make sense? Truth is not relative to our preferences and our demands and what we think it should be. Truth is what it is, right? Let me give you an example what I mean whenever I say truth is not relative. We live in a culture today that says uh, most people would say that this is a knife. All right, this is a knife. It's a very nice knife. It's got he has ridden, risen on it because I don't know if y'all know this or not, but he's not in the grave anymore. So it's got he has risen on there. It's a nice knife. I say this is a knife. But what if somebody else comes along and says, I don't think that's a knife. I think it's a hammer. And so the culture that we live in says, well, if he believes it's a hammer, then he ought to be able to believe that it's a hammer. And so to him, it is a hammer. That's what we mean whenever we say relative truth. It means that someone gets to decide whatever they want it to be. Now listen to me. That's not what truth is. It is not relevant, young people. It is not what a professor in college tells you. It is not what a high school teacher tells you. Truth is what it is. It cannot be manipulated, and it cannot be something that it isn't. It is real facts, real events, and real things. It is what it is. It is not relative. So here's what I say about this. This ain't no stinking hammer. It's a knife. Why? Because that's what it is. It's a knife, right? So truth is real facts, real events, real things. It isn't your own opinions, your own decisions, and your own perceptions. Because we know that some folks, listen to me now, this is a biblical term. We know some folks got some jacked up perceptions. Hello, somebody. There's some, there's some crazy people in this world. Did y'all know that? I'm just going to look at your neighbor and say, you one of them. Amen. I mean, just crazy people in this world. <laughs> gotcha. All right. All right, now. We know what it is, real facts, real events, real things. It is what it is. We know what it isn't. It is not relative. It just is what it is. So here's the next question. Why is truth so important? Well, let me explain it to you from a practical perspective. Without practical truth, we know uh, we would be an unstable society always living a life unsustain of unsustainability and uncertainty. If we didn't have truth that directed us and guided us, we would be an unstable society. We would be in an absolute mess, wouldn't we? If there was no truth to guide us. I want you to think about this. If there is no anticipation of truth in the world that we live in, if there is no anticipation of truth, there is no demonstration of trust. If there is no demonstration of trust, then society doesn't function properly because no one believes anything or anyone. So truth is very important. If you and I are going to be able to live in a sane society, we've got to be able to trust somebody, and we trust people because they tell the truth, right? And so we need truth in order for us to have a society that is halfway decent, right? So let's look at that a little bit further. Y'all still all right? Say amen. Because I feel like I lost somebody right there. Like, what? We need, listen, we need truth for this society to function properly. If we don't have truth, we're going to be in a mess as a society. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. We're going to think a little bit deeper on this. A lack of truth breaks down communication. Doesn't it? A lack of truth breaks down communication. If I don't trust you, I'm not talking to you. Hello, somebody. If I got important things I need to share, but I don't trust you, I'm not telling you. Why? Because I can't trust you. Why? Because you don't tell the truth. Because you, you, you understand what I'm saying? And so if, if there is no truth, then, then, and, 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 and truth breaks down, then there is no communication because I don't believe what you say and I don't trust you. So there's a breakdown in communication. Here's the second one. 
a lack of truth breaks down cooperation. Now, if you're going to help me, but you don't tell the truth, then I'm not going to ask you to help me. If you don't tell the truth about me and you lie about me, I'm not going to ask you to help me. Hello, somebody. That's just simple, people. That's simple. Hello? I mean, which one of y'all want to ask people to help you that's lying about you? Nobody. Come on. Don't be super spiritual. So think about this. A lack of truth breaks down communication. A lack of truth breaks down cooperation. A lack of truth breaks down relationships. Have you heard, ever heard this state, statement? I don't trust them as far as I can throw them. You ever heard that? Why is that? Because you don't believe them. Because they'll tell a lie. So you can't trust them because they don't tell the truth. And so therefore, it's a breakdown in a relationship. You can't have, listen, you married people, look at me. It's hard to have a valuable relationship with somebody you don't trust. Right? Somebody who doesn't tell the truth. Sir, ma'am, whoever you are, if you lie to your spouse, it's hard for them to trust you. It breaks down relationships when there is no truth involved in those relationships. Here's another one. A lack of truth breaks down expectations. You know somebody who lies all the time? You just don't expect them to tell the truth anymore, do you? You're like, they lie, man. They'd rather stand up. They'd rather climb a tree and tell a lie, stand on the ground and tell the truth. I mean, they just, they just lie all the time. And so, therefore, you don't trust them because they lie. You don't expect them to tell the truth. Here's the last one. A lack of truth keeps us from having proper foundations. Because there is no truth that is in our life, then we're building our lives on assumptions, speculations, lies, and whatever comes our way. Does that make sense? So listen, y'all good? Say amen. Look at your neighbor and say, he's about to make a statement, you need to listen. That's for you people over here too. That's right, your people. Did you know that? Your people, all right? So listen to this statement. Try living in a society that doesn't communicate or cooperate, cooperate, one that doesn't value relationships, has no expectations, and lacks any proper foundation. Societies like that destroy themselves, don't they? And that's everything that we just said is a lack of truth creates. All right, I'm going to read it again so you'll get it. Try living in a society that doesn't communicate, cooperate, one that doesn't value relationships, has no expectations, and lacks any proper foundation. Societies like that destroy themselves. Now, let me twist that and help that apply to us. Are you ready? Amen? Are you ready? Watch this. Try going to a church that doesn't communicate and cooperate. One that doesn't value relationships, has no expectations, and lacks any proper foundation. Churches like that destroy themselves. Now, let's take it even a step further. Try being a part of a ministry that doesn't communicate or cooperate. One that doesn't value relationships, has no ex expectations, and lacks any proper foundation. Ministries like that destroy themselves. You see, all of that happens because of a void of truth. A void of truth. And that's exactly why Satan does not want us to have truth as a part of our society. Because if truth can be, we can be void of truth in our society, then our society will break down. And the only thing that will take place then is chaos. And that's exactly what he wants to take place, right? And so practically, from a practical perspective, truth is necessary for us to maintain valuable community. Value, uh, hello, somebody. Now, I feel like, now watch this. I'm just going to say this to you. Don't you listen to me. I feel like some of y'all think this is, doesn't even apply to you. But I'm going to tell you something. This applies to every person from that corner to this corner and that corner to that corner. Because if you and I don't understand the importance of truth in the society that we live in, we're going to be in a bind one of these days. Amen? If our young people don't understand the importance of truth in their life and truth in their society, listen, you're going to be in a bind in a few years if you don't begin to understand that. So from a practical perspective, we need truth in our life and in our society for our society to function halfway properly. And so truth is very, very important. So let's look at it from a biblical perspective now, all right? So look at your neighbor and say, praise God, we're going to get to the Bible. Amen, praise God. We're going to get to I just had to get the practical stuff out of the way because the reality is this, they both affect one another. Biblical truth affects practical truth because there is no such thing as practical truth without a foundation of biblical truth. Does that make sense to anybody? All right, so what is biblical truth? What is biblical truth? Well, from a biblical perspective, truth is whatever God deems correct. That's what truth is. It's whatever he says 
Because He is the source of all things right, all things pure, all things perfect, and all things holy. So whatever God said, watch this, whatever God says, that's what's correct. Not what you say, but what God says. That is what truth is. Psalm 119 verse 114 says this, Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. That's what it says. Psalm 119, 160 says this. The entirety of your word, and I'll include the maps, amen. Your, the entirety of your word is truth. And every one of your righteous judgments endure forever. What does that mean? Here's what it means. It means whatever God says is true and it will stand and it will last forever and ever and ever and ever. You can argue with it all you want, but what God says is right, bless God, is right. Because He is the source of all things true. So simply stated, God's Word is truth. It'll last forever without fail. So what is practical truth? Right things, right facts. What is biblical truth? What God says. It's His Word. So I want us to look at this verse that we read just a few moments ago. All right? Let's look at this verse just a second. Look what Jesus said. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed Him. Now he's talking to some people that freshly believed and he says this, if you abide in my word, and we've already established that his word is truth. So if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. All right, you got that? He's saying to new believers, if you abide, if you take up residence, if you camp yourself and camp your heart in, in the Word of God, then here's what's going to happen. You're going to know the truth, and the truth is going to set you free. You say, what does that mean, preacher, from a biblical perspective? All right, very simple. Abiding in the Word equals knowing truth, which equals freedom. Does that make sense? Ab Hello, somebody. Abiding in the Word equals truth which equals freedom. Now, if that's the case, then I can logically assume, right, I can make a logical assumption that if abiding in the Word equals truth, which equals freedom, then not abiding in the Word equals not knowing the truth, which equals bondage, the very opposite of freedom. Does that make sense to anybody? So guess what that means? Here's what that means for you, and here's what that means for all these other people that are in this room. Don't have a steady diet of God's Word. You won't know the truth, and you'll be in bondage in many areas of your life. Know the Word of God. Know the truth of Scripture. And then you will not be in bondage, but you will live a life of freedom that God has given us, and God has prepared for us based on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So how valuable is the Word of God in you and I living a free life under heaven? It is extremely valuable. Without it, there'll be no freedom, right? And so we need the Word of God in our life. Now, listen, take note of this. If knowing the truth sets you free, and that's what the Scripture just said, didn't it? I mean, hello, somebody did. So if knowing the truth sets you free, you can bet Satan and his demonic angels don't want you to know the truth. Oh, you can believe that for sure. If they know that it'll give you freedom and it'll take you out from underneath bondage, you can better believe that the angels of hell and that the, the demons of hell and Satan himself do not want you to know what the truth is. So what do they do? Here's what they do. They use lies to wage war in your mind against the truth. That's what they do. Sounds pretty simple, but it's very clever. They use lies and they wage a war in your mind based on lie. Let me, let me ask you a personal question. Have you ever invented something somebody said that they didn't say? Anybody ever done that? You say, what do you mean? Oh, by making an assumption, you assume they thought something that they didn't think. Then you said that they said something they didn't say when they really didn't say it. And now you all jacked up. And you know what happened? <laughs> you, know, so you say, he's smart. Listen, what happened is you allowed an assumption to become a lie. And then all of a sudden that lie has captivated your mind. And so now Satan is wreaking havoc upon your life based on a lie you created. Because he put an assumption in your thought life. And you took it and made something out of it that it wasn't supposed to be. See, Satan is clever, man. 
And he wages war against our mind with lies and against the truth that we're supposed to love. Uh, Listen to this. They use lies to create doubt. And when doubt is fully established, the trust that truth provides is completely gone. Now, I'm going to read that again because I think that's a great statement. When they throw those lies and those demons throw that stuff at us, here's what happens. They use the lies to create doubt. See that in the garden. Use the lies to create doubt. And when doubt is fully established, the trust that truth provides is completely gone. And you know what's crazy? You know what's crazy? Here's what I find to be crazy. Many times we would rather settle for the lies of the enemy instead of embracing the truth of, God, embracing the truth of God's Word. That's what's so crazy about believers sometimes. We would rather believe a lie that causes destruction in our life than we would believe the truth of God's Word. Isn't that crazy? Look at your neighbor and say, you're crazy. But that's what we do all the time. Listen, watch from the pulpit to the back door. We believe the lie so many times. And it's almost like sometimes we would rather believe the lie. And turmoil just fills our life because we're not trusting in the truth of God's Word. We're believing the lies of the enemy. It's crazy. Here are some ways that Satan and his demons wage war on the truth. They try to convince you that truth is relative. All right, and we've already talked about that. But that's what the world tries to convince you of. That's what Satan tries to convince us of. You get to decide whatever truth is. So basically, in other words, if you get to decide whatever truth is, then you get to establish the morality for your life. No one is in charge of truth except for you. And so you get to make a determination what you can and you cannot do and what's right and what's wrong. So if you want to kill somebody and it's all right with you, then that, so be it. Go do it. See, how that, see where that leads? That's just nonsense. That's silliness. That's crazy. But that's what a lot of college professors will teach you. That is what a lot of them will teach you. Them bunch of liberal jokers, I'm telling you, it's crazy. Some of the things that they will teach you to where you get to decide whatever it is that's right and wrong. And so that's all good and fine as long as we don't want to kill somebody. But what if somebody thinks it's right to kill my son or kill my daughter? Then I ought to be able to say, well, you know, if it's good for you, go ahead. That's nonsense. That's ridiculous. But that's where the truth is relative argument leads us. Say, no, nobody thinks that. Listen to me. They may not say that, but if we follow the logic of the truth is relative argument, that's where it leads us. And so we just can't take that path. But that's what Satan, how how he works, the war on truth. Secondly, they try to convince you that truth is unloving. Now, do we not have a lot of that going on in the world today? We've got a lot of people trying to live their life in the way that the Bible condemns and says is not right. And here's the first thing they say. That's not very loving for you to say that's wrong. That's not very loving for God to be that way. That's not very loving for God to send somebody to hell because they don't believe in Him and so on and so forth. And so we're just standing on the truth of what the Word of God says and the first thing they do is say, that's not loving, that's not loving. I thought you were supposed to be a Christian. You're supposed to love people. I do love you. That's why I'm telling you the truth. If I didn't love you, I'd say, go on to hell then. It don't matter to me. Hello? But the first thing that Satan wants to do is wage an assault on the truth of God's Word and say, that's not very loving of you to say that or believe that. Third, they try to convince you that truth is too hard to hold on to. In a world where everybody's thinking different, everybody's doing their own thing, Satan wants you to just say, just don't worry about it. Just don't worry about it. Just do your thing, man. Just be happy. Uh, Take it easy. And just do whatever you want to do. It's too hard to hold on to all that truth and and go against the grain of this society. That's too hard. Just don't worry about it. Another one, if they try to convince you that truth is evolving, whatever works in this particular time frame, whatever worked 20 years ago, that doesn't work today. This is a different day. So truth is evolving. Whatever works 20 years from now, whatever it is, just take it up and do it. Try to convince you of that. They try to convince you that truth is too narrow. It's too narrow. You're offending people if you say all that stuff's wrong. The truth is too narrow. And so here's what we got in this world today. Are y'all listening? We got a whole bunch of people that believe truth is of the enemy instead of being of God. And so we've got an all-out assault. And here's how they do it. Their primary method of doing all of this to us is they just attack the uh, the Word of God. They attack God's Word. Now watch this. By attacking God's Word as outdated, unloving, 
too narrow, too contradictory. Satan has kept many people bound up in a pack of lies separated from true freedom. How many times have you heard somebody say, Oh, that old book. That old book, man, that thing's so outdated, man. I mean, it's only written by a bunch of men anyway. You know, why are you believing that? That thing's so old, it's not even funny. Well, I tell you this, somebody come up with two plus two, a man did, and I believe that. You know what I'm saying? That's all I'm saying. Two plus two is four. Every time. Until somebody come up with some new math or something, and two plus two might be 86. Now, I don't know. But here's what I know. This right here doesn't change. It is what it is. But what skeptics will say is, and what the devil will plant in their mind is, that book's too old. You don't need that. Here, young people, watch this. Here's what it'll do for you. Here's what the world will do for you, how they'll try to convince you. They'll say, that book's boring. That's what the devil will do to you. That's boring. Just go to church because your mom and daddy said so, but you ain't got to worry about all that stuff the preacher's saying about reading the Bible and praying and all that kind of stuff. Just live your life, do your thing. Don't worry about being obedient to that old book. You're going to get out of high school one of these days. You're going to be 18, 19, 20, and you can look your mama in the eye and say, I don't care what you believe. I don't believe it. And here's the deal. You've got the liberty to do that if you choose to do so. But that doesn't mean that this book's not right. This book is right. It is accurate. It is God's Word. But the enemy don't want you to believe that. He don't want you to live by it, and he don't want you to focus on it. Why? Because he wants to destroy truth in your mind. Because if he can destroy truth in your mind, he'll destroy your life. Amen? He will absolutely destroy your life. Understand this. Lies create bondage, and bondage creates fear. And fear, and fear, listen to this. No relationships can be built on fear. Now that's a good one. Because I want you to hear what I'm saying to you. Lies create bondage. And bondage creates fear. And no relationships can be built on fear. None. And fear generally is caused because of lies and bondage. And so you and I got to understand that the Bible says in John 8, 31 and 32 that knowing the truth does not leave us in bondage, but knowing the truth makes us free. It makes us free free. If we're not believing the truth, walking in the truth, Satan is keeping us in bondage. We are caged up when we could be free. Listen to that. We are caged up when we could be free. I, I thought about what the, how I could illustrate that, and here's what it's like to me. Knowing the truth, but, but having the truth of the Word of God, but not living by that truth, not knowing that truth, it, it keeps us in bondage. It's kind of like sitting in the, for a Christian, it's kind of like sitting in a jail cell for months and months and months and months and months and months and starving in that jail for months and months and months and months and you got the key to the cell in your hand. It's like you're just sitting there in bondage, no freedom, starving, and you got the key right there. But you're still just sitting there in bondage. That's what it's like for a Christian who has the Word of God but allowed the enemy to manipulate their mind in such a way that they believe the lies, stay in bondage instead of believing the truth of God's Word and walk in freedom that God has given us. That's what it's like. Caged up, but the key is in your hand. Here's my question. Why would I want to live in bondage when I can be free? Why would anybody in this room want to be in bondage when you can go free? Right? Amen? It's crazy. So here's the final question. How do we win the war against Satan's attacks on truth in our minds? How do we win the war against that? Very simple. Just practical. I want you to listen. Believe in God's Word. Believe in God's Word. Measure every lie of the enemy up against the truth of God's Word. Right? Because His Word is truth. Third, never settle any thought until you measure it up against Scripture. That's a good one. That's a good one. Never settle any thought in your mind. Never let it settle until you measure it up with Scripture. What does the truth of God's Word say about that? You say, how do I measure it up? How do I do that? Okay, that's a great question. If you want to measure up thoughts up, to, up against the Word of God, here's how you do that. You can ask three questions. Number one, when that thought comes, you can say, or that situation comes, you can say, what does the Word of God say about this thought or about this particular situation? Because I promise you this, and you need to hear me on this one. The Word of God answers every question you ever got you ever have about any situation that you could possibly have in your life, right? Jesus experienced it all, and the answers are there for all of it. So what does the Word of God say about the thought of the situation? Secondly, 
Ask yourself when that thought comes and you're measuring it up against God's Word, ask yourself, what would Jesus Christ do with this thought or this situation? See, if you, if you need help with that, they made bracelets. What would Jesus do? Bracelets. If you need help with that, get you one of those bracelets, man. But when that thought comes or that situation is there, then here's what you need to say. What would Jesus do with that thought? And what would Jesus do in this situation? And whatever it is that Jesus would do, and whatever the Scripture says that Jesus would do in that situation, that's what you want to do. Third, how can I ask this question? How can I respond where God will get the glory? So when Satan throws that thought at you, or you find yourself in a situation where you're not sure about what to do, the enemy may be attacking, then here's what you need to do. You need to ask yourself, okay, what, would I, what can I do in this situation where Jesus will get the greatest glory? And do that. And if you do that, those three things, you ask yourself those three questions whenever a thought enters your mind or a situation comes up that you're tempted in. I promise you, if you will be obedient to do those things and follow up with that, then here's what you're going to do. You're going to defeat the enemy at that moment in your life. You're going to be free and clear to say, ha, 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 Satan, I got you because I measured up what you said in my mind, that lie you told me. I measured it up against the Word of God, and I'm not falling for your schemes. And you'll be able to walk away free. Amen? Walk away in victory. You say, preacher, I agree with all that. I think that's all good. But here's the problem I got. The problem I got is I'm not saved. Well, guess what? Jesus got an answer for that too. Did you know that? You say, what's the answer? Well, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through me. Well, I'll be dull. Jesus did give us the answer, didn't us? What's the answer? He is the answer for our sin problem. He is the answer for our salvation issue. And so tonight, listen, wherever you are, because I, I want to be honest with you, because I, I know we want to close. I'm going to close. I'm good at closing I know, I'm just kidding. I close a lot of times. Okay, anyway. Here's the deal, and I want you to hear me. This is me heart to heart. There, there's some of y'all, you struggling with this, man. You are, you struggling with it. There's a whole lot of lies bouncing around in your mind about people, about stuff, and the enemy's just bouncing them all over you. And he's wearing you out, quite frankly. Because you're not measuring up all those thoughts up against God's Word. Which is very vital. And so tonight, maybe just tonight, you're one of those people that need to focus on taking those thoughts and lies that are there. And bringing them into submission to God's Word. And get that stuff straight, right? Ex enjoy some, listen, enjoy some freedom. Some freedom, man. Some of y'all, you're here, to be honest with you, you don't care about any of this. And the reason you don't care about it is because you're lost. You don't know Jesus. And the answer to that is just Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He died so that you could have everlasting life. And you just need to turn from your sin, put your faith in Jesus, trust in Him alone for salvation, and let Him save you. But I'm telling you this. There is no reason under heaven why anybody in this room ought to walk out of this room still in bondage. There is no reason. If you do, it's because you wanted to. Because Jesus offers freedom, and He doesn't offer freedom tomorrow. He offers freedom now. And so it's just up to us to take advantage of this freedom. Satan is there. He's busting these thoughts in our mind. But God is greater than he who is in the world. Amen? And so we just need to be obedient to him tonight. My prayer for you, Bonita Road Baptist Church, and myself, is that we would not let lies settle into our minds, but we would let the truth of God's word settle there and enjoy the freedom that is ours because of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Amen?